When it comes to investing in precious metals, you need a source you can trust who offers you choices and empowers you to maximize your wealth. That's where Roberts & Roberts Brokerage can help. Roberts & Roberts is a trusted name in precious metals. Since 1977, Roberts & Roberts has been providing you with the finest gold and silver bullion, coins, rounds, and bars at genuine and honest prices. They make it easy to invest in precious metals and work with you to suit your investment needs. In addition to offering gold and silver for sale for U.S. dollars, Roberts & Roberts Brokerage is now accepting Bitcoin in exchange for their quality precious metals products. To speak with a professional from Roberts & Roberts about investing in precious metals, call toll-free 800-874-9760. Write this number down, 800-874-9760. Visit Roberts & Roberts online at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. On behalf of Roberts & Roberts, here's hoping your day is as good as gold. If you don't know who I am, my name is Davi Barker. People know me from... Uh, dailyanarchist.com, bitcoinnotbombs.com. I did some work. I do some work for Silver Circle. I'm uh, essentially a writer and an artist in the Liberty Movement. Uh, so I want to begin with kind of an explanation about how I ended up here talking about psychology. <laughs> um, there's an expression among Holocaust survivors that no one survived the Holocaust. <laughs> Uh, not one German, not one Jew, not one Gypsy, not one homosexual. No one survived the Holocaust because living in German fascism so destroyed everyone that no one was the person that they were born to be. And when I heard that, what occurred to me immediately was no one survives the state. And it led me to think about how have I failed to survive the state? Like how have I, my life, how am I not the person that I'm supposed to be because of growing up in this system? And um, what I had to admit to myself was, I'm only a writer and I'm only an artist because at a young age I saw how screwed up the system was and I saw art and writing as a way to change that. So really I wasn't supposed to be a writer or an artist. And then I started thinking, what was I before I saw how screwed up the system was? I was interested in science. Well, it's a little late in the game for me to go back to school and uh, get a degree in some sort of science, but I'm an agorist, so I don't care about the university certificate. And uh, so I'm totally unqualified for what I'm about to present. No, you're totally qualified. Well, thank you. Um, so <laughs> since, since we're talking about authority, I want to make it perfectly clear this is not a classroom. I'm not a teacher. You can interrupt as much as you want. You can leave to use the restroom if you want. You, can, you don't have to raise your hand. So <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. So you guys can, you know, if I, if I, if I make a mistake or whatever, just yell back at me. It's totally, totally fine. <laughs> We're, we're all equals here. So I want to talk to you about why among all the science. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so among all the sciences, why psychology? And the reason is uh, because, as, as many of you maybe are familiar with this model, factually speaking, the state doesn't exist. The government exists. There are tanks. There are police. There are pieces of paper that things are written on. And they displace water, and they melt at certain temperatures, and they burn at certain temperatures, and you can study them with the conventional physical sciences. The state does not exist. The state can only be studied with soft science, like psychology, like sociology, like metaphysics. Like, you know, so the reason to study psychology if you're interested in libertarianism or anarchy is because factually speaking, your enemy only exists in the mind. So if you're going to fight him or it, you have to fight it there. You can have all the cameras and all the votes and all the rifles in the world, but if you're not attacking it in the mind, it doesn't matter. It's still there, because it's probably in your mind. Your mind. So uh, libertarians and anarchists who are familiar with the psychology of obedience and the psychology of authority are mostly familiar with the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment. I'm seeing a lot of nods in the room, so I'm guessing most of you are familiar with these experiments. Uh, but uh, just to briefly summarize, uh, the, the Stanley Milgram Experiment uh, is an experiment where subjects were randomly separated as either teachers or learners, and teachers were instructed to give learners an electroshock if they answered questions incorrectly. And the test was to see how much voltage would somebody deliver to uh, a subject if they were instructed to by a scientist in a lab coat. And what the, uh, what the teacher didn't know is that the learner was fake and that the electroshocks were fake and that they were the subject of the experiment. 
Uh, Stanley Milgram's contemporaries at the time thought that 1% of people would comply with this. And it turned out that 65% of people, at least in the first iteration of the experiment, delivered a lethal 450 volt shock to a complete stranger because a scientist said, the experiment requires that you continue. <laughs> so this is not legal authority. This is not, uh, there's no consequences if this what person. Percentage of subjects refused to participate at all? They could just leave. A lot of them uh, refused to participate at all, like didn't well, push the button once, was 1%. When they were, so probably they participate, we don't know. But they initially agreed, they were the teacher, and then they realized they were teaching and said, thank you, I'm leaving. How many people did that, if anybody? Well, it's the opposite of 65%. There'd be 35%. No, I guess if you want, if you want, do you know this? We have Brian here. Brian is a, a real psychology student, and uh, so he might be able to field that question. Yeah, well, the problem with, with that question, let's say it's a bad question, is that they actually did many different versions with slightly different variations on uh, instructions, uh, the screams of pain coming from the, uh, the actor who was playing the game. Um, but the percentages giving, um, they always were referring to the percentage of people who were willing to deliver the, the largest level of shock, to go all the way to the button at the end labeled with triple X, and that they were told was very dangerous. Um, so the remaining percentage stopped somewhere else. There were some people who refused as soon as they realized it was painful to the person, the very few. Well, that's uh, the others stopped when the person was screaming and pleading. That is my question. So. People who realized that they if you're, if you're, the people who quit very early was just a small handful. If you're interested in like the full scope of the experiment itself, Stanley Milgram's book is called Obedience to Authority: An Experimental View. And I really don't read all the crazy details. Okay, well that's where I just want to know this small percentage who refused at the very early stage, long before the triple X. Okay, if you want to leave me, if you want to leave me, I know that 1% refused, it was 1% that refused as soon as they realized they were hurting the person, and I know that nobody insisted that the experiment be halted. Uh, but if you want to leave me your email, I know where to find that statistic, and I can let you know when I get home, if that's all right. That's excellent. So uh, Stanford Prison Experiment um, is uh, essentially, it's, it's 20 uh, college students screened for mental health who are randomly assigned as either prisoner or guard and they're put into a mock prison in the basement of uh, the Stanford Psychology Building uh, to, to study prison psychology. And it was supposed to go on for two weeks and they halted it after six days when they realized that there were instances of torture occurring. And uh, specifically Philip Zimbardo, he's the scientist who was uh, running it, said that he too was compromised by the psychology of the experiment because he had assigned himself prison warden in the mock prison. And so he was on the side of the guards and he allowed torture to continue longer than he should have. And um, so these are the, the two big experiments. People are pretty familiar with them, but there's a, there's a number of experiments since then that, um, that people don't know about. And so those are the ones that I want to primarily talk about. And what's interesting about these is that after the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment, the ethical guidelines on experimentation were changed. So uh, these new experiments, although they give us the results that we would expect, they're not as dramatic. But I still think that we should be talking about them. What's that? They should be as dramatic. They should be as dramatic. Yeah, well, the people are going through that shit anyway. Why not? Hear me out. Uh, so the first one I want to talk to is called How Power Corrupts or uh, Power and Deception by Dana Carney. And um, what, what she hypothesized was that power was what she called a stress buffering mechanism which meant that there are these normal stressors that we experience that can be measured when we're lying and that people in high power positions wouldn't exhibit them. So um, she, associate, she established power with a personality test. Random subjects came to the experiment, they were given a personality test, and they were told that they either tested as high power or low power individuals. But this was random. The purpose of the personality test was just to give it legitimacy, right? Because legitimacy is what makes power possible. So um, you have half of them assigned as leaders, you have half of them as uh, assigned as subordinates, and then they're given one hour of busy work. Leaders get to work in an executive office, and subordinates get to work in a small windowless cubicle, and they do busy work for an hour, after which they have a mock negotiation over wage. And the purpose of all of that is just so that they have established themselves as leaders or subordinates. Then half of them are given an opportunity to steal $100. 
And all they have to do to steal this $100 is lie in the exit interview. And if they can convince the, the scientist, the, uh, the person giving the exit interview that they've lied, they can keep the $100 bill. And the exit uh, interviewee doesn't know who has the $100 bill. But while they're doing this, they are hooked up to some, um, or I guess this isn't the EKG one. They're, they're, they're test emotionally. They're given uh, self-reporting emotional surveys before and after. They uh, are test their cortisol. Is st cortisol is a stress hormone you can get from a saliva test. So they're stressed. That's to see how stressed out they are. Um, they're given what's called the Stroop test, which is sort of a computerized test of reaction time. So you test it before the incident and you test it after the incident. And you get a reading on how sort of cognitively paired they are from lying. And then you have, you have video of the interviews that they say give sort of nonverbal cues like parsing your lips or shrugging your shoulders or increased word speed, things like that. So in every measure, the high power individuals who were lying measured the same as the high power or low power individuals who were telling the truth. So they showed no, they showed no stressors from lying. But the low power individuals who were lying showed all of these behavioral and physiological clues that they were lying. So in a sense, I mean, maybe not 100%, but uh, liars can pass a lie detector test, for example, maybe, or whatever. But the, the, o the only place where they deferred from truth tellers was the self-reporting emotional survey. In the self-reporting emotional survey, high-powered liars reported pleasure. So they actually enjoy lying if they're in high power positions. Because they're psychopaths. Because they're psychopaths. But they're random. Oh, really? That's what it is. But they were randomly chosen. This is, this is that, thank you for reminding me. That is the important thing. These are not authentically high power individuals. These are people randomly selected to do one hour of work in an executive office. Yeah, they were told they could, that, that they had to convince the uh, scientists that they didn't have the $100 bill. Well, the point is, they become, they behave psychopathically just by playing the role of being. Right. So it isn't just that power attracts corruption, it's that power induces corruption. Right, and that's what you see in the Stanford Milgram or the Stanford experiment, the Milgram experiment. That's what you see here, is that it isn't just, it is literally that power corrupts. It's not that that the evil people in society gravitate toward government. It's that having the government corrupts good people that end up there. Were right? there any exceptions? Any people in the experiment who were of course, these are all sort of generalized statistics. These same aren't. Same question, what percentage were exactly? I, 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 I don't I remember. Ask the same question over again. I want to find this law to catch up. Some potential. This one percent of humanity is uncorruptible. I don't think that they're that. I don't think that they're well. That hasn't been found uh, experimentally, at least. But uh, there's sort of a catch I'm getting to. That if half of the group is designated as. Uh, leaders, even executive office, uh, that are in a rough manner, if 1% of them, in, the, in spite of all that, did not lie and uh, were truthful, that gives you hope. What's their background? I do know something about the Stanford prison experiment, that the two people, the two prisoners who resisted the most mm -hmm. were uh, an evangelical Christian and a communist. And the reasoning was that the speculation on the part of Philip Zimbardo was that it's because they had strong core identities of their own. And that when people go into this scenario and they're given an identity by someone else, they'll adopt it if they don't have a strong creed of their own. Two of the prisoners. Two of the prisoners. Not of the guards. Well, wasn't there some people who like opted out right away when they started the, the prison experiment? I don't, there I don't no, think so. Not enough. There they, wasn't, there wasn't <laughs> I don't, I don't they think they could leave at any time. They, nobody left. Right. They were all told that they could leave, but the, the prison experience generated a kind of camaraderie in the group, and they felt that they were betraying the other prisoners if they left. Yeah. Even though they were told repeatedly that they were free to leave, and yeah. So same with the Milgram experiment. In the Milgram experiment, people offered, people wanted to leave. Or sorry, yeah, in the Milgram experiment, people wanted to leave. And people began showing these signs of incredible distress and, and not wanting to. And, and they offered the money back. They said, I don't want to participate in this experiment anymore. Right? And they would offer the money back. And the scientists would just say, the experiment requires that you continue, which is not an order. It's just sort of like it's verbal prodding by an authority figure. Right? And they continued. Or, I mean, most of them. Um, <clears throat> so the next one I want to talk to is called Power and Distress. Um, which I don't think is a very good title because distress is measured in all these experiments. I call it power and compassion. Uh, but this is by uh, Jurban A. Van Cleef, who is from the University of Amsterdam. 
And he aimed to determine whether there's a disparity in high power and low power individuals as far as reciprocal emotional response. So um, <clears throat> this time, subjects were given a personality test, only this one was not random. This was actually intended to identify them as high power or low power individuals in their real life. And then they were randomly paired with each other to share an emotionally traumatic experience, to essentially tell stories to one another of, of a personal pain, of suffering, or something like that, while hooked up to um, an electrocardiogram, an EKG <clears throat> machine, to measure their stress while they're talking to each other. And, and what they found was um, that, that first off, uh, low power individuals who are listening to the suffering of others have a reciprocal measurement in the, in the electrocardiogram. They experience higher stress when the other person experiences higher stress. So simply the verbal connection causes a physiological connection that you could associate with compassion. They're experiencing stress because the other person is experiencing stress. High power individuals do not experience this or did not in, in a statistically significant way. John? Uh, can you explain a little bit more about what makes a high power individual? You know, like MLK would be considered a high power individual. I, I would. Yeah, I don't have a copy of the, the test itself. Um, but I think that it, in, this, in this particular survey, it was how they thought of themselves. So it's, it's a matter of self-reporting. Um, so it, it, um, it isn't necessarily that like, they're all like politicians or they're all CEOs or something like that. It, it is how they, they feel about themselves in, in their own life. It's originally a locus of control perspective. People who believe that they control what happens in their own destiny are high power that it's the external forces that kind of like draw them to wherever they're going right. or low power. Well, that's almost negative then, if that's the case, because we want people to have their sort of own locus of control. But, yeah, um, but people who, who say, well, I just kind of like go along and get along, yeah. those are low power people. People who say, well, I say where we're going right. are high power. Yeah, but I think we would have to look at the test because yeah. the test they used is what, what are the questions? In, yeah. all, in, all of, in all these experiments, those conditions are operationalized, so it means that the scientists decide what high power and low power means yeah. in each individual experiment. So, yeah. so we'd have to it's look at the test. I don't, have it. I don't have it here, unfortunately. Yeah. Are they told that you're high power? Right. But is it, yeah. Nonetheless, the, the people who they selected as being the high power people turned out to be the ones that didn't have the stress response. Right, the high power individuals don't have reciprocal stress response, right? Um, the other thing that, yeah? After the test, were they told whether they tested high or low? Yeah, and, and the questionnaire after the test is sort of based on that. Oh, you mean af after the test, not after the experiment? I don't think they told them. No, they didn't tell I don't think that they did. I think they probably got the results after the whole thing was finished, after the exit interview and everything. Um, but no, that would bias the data. I can't imagine that they would, they, they would do that. Um, there's also an instance of self-reporting in this experiment. Again, they were given an emotional survey before and after about their experience of sharing the story with this person. But in this emotional survey, they were also asked to identify the emotions of their partner. And what that means is that high power individuals successfully identified the lo their, their partner's emotions. They just didn't respond. So it's not that they don't, it's not that they can't see the distress of others, it's that they see it and they don't respond, right? Which is, they don't have a conscience. <laughs> yeah, they're psychopaths. So we can keep coming back to that. Um, the other, the other, um, the other issue was low power individuals who are with a partner who, who, who are with high power listeners, the story, if a, if a, or any, any storyteller, if a storyteller is with a high power listener, they actually experience higher rates of stress when they're not receiving reciprocal, like a, a re reciprocal emotion, if that makes sense. So if you're telling an emotional story and the other person's deadpan, it's actually more suffering for you than if the person was, was, was responding. Right, so if, if, if they're not actively sharing the story with you. So in that sense also, um, high power individuals could, in some social sense, cause greater suffering with their friends and family in their lives. Uh, this is called, they called it power, distress, and compassion. I like just calling it power and compassion because all these experiments involve d a measure of distress. So, um, <coughs> but yeah, it's also, it's, they're, they're also all of the sort of notes on these are in this pamphlet you guys maybe have seen. But we're going to get beyond this in just a minute. I got one, one more of these experiments I want to tell you about. Uh, this is called Power and Hypocrisy by Joris Lammers and Adam Galinsky. 
And they aim to, so the way that they're measuring hypocrisy in this experiment is on a nine point scale. Um, you are asked to rate the moral infraction uh, from one to nine of minor traffic violations, minor tax evasions, and receiving of stolen property. And then you are sort of asked to rate it when someone else does it, and then you are sort of asked to rate it when you do it yourself. And the question is, what they're calling a measurement of hypocrisy is a disparity in that number. If you're, if you're harsh on other people and lenient on yourself, they call that hypocrisy. And in some people, they found that they were uh, harsh on themselves and lenient on others. And so they invented the word uh, hyperhypocrisy, but that's just a made up word. Uh, <laughs> So um, this is, again, people, this guy actually did five, a battery of five experiments. And the fifth one, I think, is the most important. And it's sort of like the silver bullet that I want to uh, expand upon. Uh, but essentially, people are randomly assigned high power and low power in a number of different ways. And he, he comes up with some funny ways to do this. So sometimes it's um, randomly assigned. And then they're asked to recall an experience. So if you're randomly assigned power, your job is to tell a story about a time that you felt like you were in power. And if you're a subordinate, then you're supposed to tell a story about a time that you felt you were, you were disempowered. But he also did it with a word search. He, he played word games with people. So if you were a randomly assigned high power individual, you'd sit in a room, you'd play crossword puzzles and word searches and things like that for an hour. And all of the words in those games are high power words. And in the other group, all of those words are, high, are low power words. So you're just sitting in a room doing crossword puzzles, but the words are things like, like authority or power or control. Yeah. And the other group is sitting in a room doing word puzzles and their words are things like slave or, or maybe control goes both ways, I don't know. But, <laughs> but so I mean, that struck me as a very unusual way to assign um, power roles, but it, but it worked. The point is that the, the results still showed that um, high power individuals are more critical of people who speed than they are of themselves. They're more critical of people <coughs> who do tax evasion than they are of themselves. And they're more critical. The example was a bicycle. If you found a bicycle in the road and you took it, and then later you found out that the bicycle was stolen, would you return the bicycle, or what would, what would you, how would you rate the moral infraction of keeping the bicycle? And people rated keeping a bicycle for others was more vulgar than for themselves. And the high power individuals in all of these um, had that disparity, whereas the low power people, they were sort of closer to a median where they considered it the same. The only um, the, the interesting thing about this one is the fifth experiment in this uh, battery of experiments. And um, so it's the same thing, randomly assigned, asked to recall a story, but he creates a third category. And he asks people to recall a story where they were in a position of power that they didn't feel that they deserved. So, so there's an illegitimate power category in this experiment. And that's where they found what they call hypocrisy, that people who felt that their power was illegitimate were more harsh on themselves and less, less harsh on others. So they actually experienced the opposite of hypocrisy. And they were, like, they, were, they, they were even below the low power group. So what makes that, I mean, this is just one experiment on hypocrisy. And it's not like very dramatic results, because it's not a very dramatic experiment. But that distinction between legitimate and illegitimate power is so important that I think that that it should be expanded upon. Um, because if, if that's true, if it's possible that causing somebody to suddenly think that their power is illegitimate actually gives them the opposite psychological response, that might carry over into all of the other experiments. right? Like that might, um, that might reverse their, their willingness to cheat, reverse their willingness to lie, reverse their willingness. Yeah? For instance, in the lower experiment, they were then told that the scientist is not a scientist and all this stuff. Yeah, he's a pizza delivery guy in a lab coat. Do you still want to obey him? Then, right, like, then the, for the pain they inflicted, then in our own situation. That it might reverse. And in fact, um, they found that, the, that um, in the Stanford prison experiment, the only way that they could get them to leave the experiment, because the, the people didn't want to halt, the, the subjects did not want to halt the experiment, even when the scientists decided that it was time to, is that they had to keep being reminded that it's, a, that it's an experiment, not a prison. Because one of, one of the rules in the beginning of the experiment was you cannot refer to it as an experiment. right? That was part of creating the world of the prison. You, the subjects could not refer to the prison as, an, as a laboratory or refer to the prison as an experiment. That was against the rules. You have to pretend it's real. So until the scientists began referring to it as an experiment, people were not willing to leave. And so that I think that is an example of this undercutting of legitimacy, that once 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 that enters their mind and they're like, oh, this is not a prison. Oh, I am not a prisoner. I am just a student in a laboratory. <laughs> then suddenly the, the power disappears, right? It sort of dispels. 
Um, we're all in a giant prison Yeah, we're all in a giant prison experience now. <laughs> so um, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have heard of Stanley Milgram experiment and Stanford prison experiment before this talk? So that, that's most of the room. I think that's all of the room. So how many of you have heard of uh, power and compassion, power and hypocrisy, and power and deception before reading this or before attending this? They had some on History Channel. They did? Yeah. Okay. pretty interesting. I'll bet. Was it the one where they made the different people from different socioeconomic groups play a lopsided game of Monopoly? So they took somebody who was poor and made them have like three times the amount of money in a, in a two player Monopoly game. And that the, the person who was uh, you know, poor for most of their life started showing psychopathic, like, I'm not going to let you go by without paying the full tax on my hotel and all this other stuff. Okay. Where the, the then the, the, the richer people, they had to play the low hand. They uh, showed empathy on, on everything. It was, so they reversed. Yeah. And when the power dynamic reverses. So, yeah. What I remember from that was very profound. Uh, what they said is that the people who are the best liars were also, maybe it was a different experiment, but they said the people who they did it, a, a, a questionnaire, who everyone thought that was in the group thought was the leader. And then the leader was invariably the best, best liar. They also right. Was the, that he correlated. Yeah, there was a, cor there was a I mean, it was a direct correlation between the people, the best liars, and the ones who the group <laughs> felt was the leader of the group. Right. So um, the point that I'm making is that nobody's heard of these experiments. And then the reason that I think that that is is the ethical guidelines. That because of the ethical guidelines that were passed after Milgram and Stanford were sort of, were, uh, it's, it's the APA, I guess. Um, like they're not doing it someplace without revealing the data, I'm sure. Well, so what it means is that these experiments are all very tame. And because they're tame, they don't sort of infect the culture. We don't see a whole lot of documentaries or books written about them. And it sort of becomes water cooler talk in the psychology wing of various universities. And, and we don't hear about it. So um, what I'm arguing is that that means that uh, we have to do them ourselves. That, um, ah. that anarchists and libertarians are constantly saying, the APA regulations are not law. The APA regulations are ethical guidelines mostly that uh, influence public funding. And as anarchists and libertarians, we should be against public funding anyway. So if we want to see a continuation of psychological research on obedience and authority, then we should be willing to fund it ourselves, and we should be willing to do it ourselves, and we shouldn't be relying on public universities. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, so this is where we're going now. So I have a proposal for an experiment, and um, it's on police brutality. So, so here's what I would like to do. Um, I would set up probably in a mall if there's a way to get a more random sampling that would be ideal um, But the idea would be that you would sort of have a person like a scientist with a clipboard who is offering people in the population To participate in some sort of consumer report or product Sort of you know come try come watch this this movie trailer and tell me what you think about it and so they walk down this hall and At the end of the hall. There's a door with a camera above it. The scientist makes some reference to the camera they walk into this room and then they're sitting in a waiting room. In the waiting room, there's a television screen. The television screen immediately references to the camera in the hallway and the person sitting in the waiting room now knows that they're watching the hallway that they just came from. A scientist says some things, maybe he gets them to sign the clipboard, whatever we sort of decide needs to happen, but uh, he says that he'll, he'll be right back. So he goes through a second door. This door has to say exit above it. So um, after some time that this person is sitting, once it's sort of clear that they've made the connection with the video screen, the scientist will come out with a previous participant in the survey, thank him for his service, and I invite him to sort of leave out the main door. He'll collect the clipboard from the subject, and he'll go out the exit door, so two doors, opposite directions. As soon as the second person, who is a confederate of, of the experiment, walks through the door to leave, the video screen becomes a recording. The recording is um, an instance of police brutality. The, the, per the subject sitting on the couch in the waiting room will see the person he just saw walk through the room, walk into the hallway, come onto the screen. He'll hear audio from the hallway. He'll see visual on the screen of this person being attacked by a police officer. 
And so the question is, how bad can this instance of police brutality get before a person will open that door? Because opening that door constitutes intervention. They don't have to physically assault anybody. They don't even have to be in the same room as the police officer. But if they were going to open that door, then that means that they intended to intervene. And at that point, you can sort of remove the curtain and you can enter into an exit interview and you can ask them, what were you planning on doing? Were you planning on yelling? Were you planning on filming? Were you planning on, maybe you don't even know what you're going to do. Maybe you just know that you have to do something, right? So um, there's a couple of problems. Uh, because we're abandoning the APA ethical guidelines, I think it's important that we write our own ethical guidelines. And so I'm looking for ethicists in the movement yeah. that, um, that I can consult with because I'm not an ethicist, I'm an artist, like I said. Um, so there are problems of trauma. The question is how traumatic of a visual depiction um, can you present to a person and, and not be considered aggression by our standards? Because, it is, I mean, at some point you are harming the person, I think. I don't understand why we need ethics guidelines for psychological experiments if we're people that don't treat each other badly anyway. You have to have definitions. Well, yeah, yeah you, you have, have to have definitions. Because, with all the definitions because when I present this idea, a lot of people bring up an experiment called compliance. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the compliance experiment, this is another example of a renegade psychological experiment. This wasn't approved by the APA. In fact, this guy is currently being hunted by the police. And um, no, nothing like that. Well, this is what he did. He uh, made phone calls to fast food restaurants. He asked to speak to a manager. He told the manager that he was a police officer, that one of their cashiers was holding drugs, and that that person needed to hold that person in, in, in the back room until the officer arrived. Then he, content, he proceeded to conduct strip searches of the cashier using the manager as a surrogate on location. And the question is how much will the manager follow the orders of a police officer they've never seen on the phone? And the answer is that they strip search, they strip search their employees. I, I don't know, there's a documentary coming out about this soon. This, it's already out. Well, it's called Compliance if you want to Google it. But this is completely unethical. And this is why I think that as, as okay, because, because if we're trying to build a voluntary society, that voluntary society is going to include scientific research, and scientific research is going to include ethical guidelines. It's going to include best standards of practices that are produced by the market. So, uh, yeah? Yeah, so um, I'm just curious about how you plan to design, or, or who, first of all, who's involved with, with the research? You know, of course, if you're doing science, you're trying to get at the truth. Um, so, I mean, you would want I assume to have your team to be composed of people who are not necessarily anarchists. Sure. Um, and even people who are opposed to anarchism. That would be and fine. people who are opposed to um, like egalitarianism and, and are, aren't, are, skeptic, or are skeptical of like you know, flat organizations. So you mean as far as analysis of the results? Everything. Or, or design, design and analysis. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it's I think that's a fantastic idea, and I agree um, that you know public funding is bad for for science in general. But it's just like you still want to have the rigor of. Just right. It's about the methodology, though. I mean, if, if the methods are sound, it doesn't matter what source you're coming from. Well, but this I'm saying, okay, okay, even if it's not a matter of um, me, even if it's not a matter of like the the knowledge that you derive from it, in terms of its effectiveness as a study to like actually convince people, Bias. right? Um, I mean, you're fighting against the legitimacy of the APA and all these other institutions that you know we we disagree that they have legitimacy, but the fact of the matter is that anarchists are illegitimate, sure, and public funding is legitimate. So uh, I'm just saying, you know, well, in mind. except that the public accepts shows like MythBusters and What Would You Do and Candy Camera and and things like that. I feel like when the when the public is has the ability to see the statistic and see the video and see the presentation make for themselves and, and make it real, make it make it a documentary, really? make it a YouTube, yeah. even t television shows. Thirty Days. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. That's <clears> essentially a, an experiment. It's not really scientifically rigorous, but people accept it, right? Because they've seen it. And you don't have to. There you go, John. I'm sorry, John was next, and then Nick. Uh, yeah, I think it could potentially be harmful to the uh, participants, uh, especially if someone was a recent victim of police brutality, right. or they grew up having their their parents abuse them their whole lives. For them to be exposed to violence, uh, I can even think of my fiance Catherine. She <coughs> never watched television growing up, and whenever we watch movies where violence takes place, she has a physical, a physiological reaction. <coughs> whereas I'm desensitized to it because I watched the tube growing up. 
So I think that should be considered because we could be inserting people into a situation that could bring them emotional and even physical harm to their, their person. So that's definitely so something we have to explore. What's that? Could you have an alternate out? There's an exit door. That's the reason for the exit door. So they don't have to intervene and they don't have to watch. There's an exit door. And they've seen people leave through that door. So, yeah, they know it's an option. Can we, I'm sorry, I call, uh, Nick was next. I just, I'm sorry, sorry. He homesteaded this spot. So, <laughs> Nick, what's up? Uh, well, something just came to mind. You could, instead of like putting the camera like right in front of them, it could be around the corner where they can look and see. They know there's a camera there. They don't have to look at it. But if they want to look at it, it's there, but they can still hear it. Yeah. But my, my original. Yeah. Oh, so they, they actually have to move to see the camera. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. The or the, the, yeah, the, the, the screen, not the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what I was going to say is. Yeah, I guess a few things. Um, you might give people the progress after the test to not have a data uh, public. Um, as far as right. if the reaction is something they don't want. It's kind of epic. So yeah, from a, from a filmmaking perspective, you have to get waivers from anyone whose image or name that you want to use. But from a scientific perspective, I think the data, like as long as you're not including their personal information, their reaction becomes part of the data set. And I don't think there's anything on that. So I mean, you might even ahead of time say you might film this or whatever, but right, you are kind of seeing this about what you're doing. I mean, I, 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 it is kind of a proposal. You're not deceiving them. You're not limiting their creativity. You're just giving them. Here, you're just putting them in a situation that's cold, and they don't expect it. But right. they may know what their reaction on a documentary. I can see somebody leaving the exit, intending to intervene to find somebody outside the exit. Just purely based on your experiment, there's somebody mm -hmm. behind that door. So right. you might be the saying, oh, yeah, yeah, get somebody else in front of them. Mm -hmm. right. and another thing is doing the same experiment when it's not cops, exactly the same thing. Right. So, so I want to talk about that for just a second. The idea of using a different, using a same video, not a cop. What I, what I, my ideal, I don't know, if you, have you guys seen Silver Circle? You guys kind of familiar with that animation? So the way that movie is done is um, <laughs> actors are sort of wearing these neon green tennis balls and they're in a green room and they record the vector information of all of the motion of the actors and then that information is brought into the computer and digitized and the, lay, the, the skins of the characters are laid over these wireframes of, of real people that they've captured using uh, the green screen. So what I'd like to do ideally is have one episode of police brutality. So you're using the same motion for every video, for every instance, for every iteration of the experiment, and you can just lay different skins. So maybe it's a cop, maybe it's not. Maybe you could do black on white, male on female, straight on gay. You could do every iteration by changing the characters in the video. And because the motion is all the same, you have the same video. You're, you don't have disparity in performances so that you don't have that as an as a unintended variable um, in the reaction. Uh, but yeah, that is the point of the exit door, so that they have, a, that, that was the contribution of Ben Stone, that he suggested the exit door. I think the guy that brought him in could be there to also, you know, see if they're going to intervene another way. Like, hey man, there's a guy doing that for Right. Well, he knows the scientist is through the exit door. Right. So if he took the exit door in the exit, in the, in the closing interview, he might say that he was going to get help. You wouldn't necessarily know. Like, Prop? I mean, yeah, you know, like the diagram to show people. Let's go Ernie. Ernie? Instead of getting bogged down in the beginning of the result and the experiment and why to do it and all that, let's go ahead and walk it through. Tell us why you're even doing it to what end and then we'll get all detailed. Well, well sure, the goal is um, to have an, a, a fresh example of a psychological experiment yeah. on authority that is dramatic enough to impact the culture so that we can demonstrate the power corrupts in, in a way that is not from the 70s. Because we're still calling on these old experiments that, I mean, are, I mean the Milgram experiment was repeated, but the Stanford Prison experiment was never repeated. And if you, stu if you study it, it's not even that scientifically rigorous itself. So it's not really a great source of data. And so I'm, I'm suggesting, like, not only that we need fresh examples to influence the culture, to influence sort of people. Right. You, you, I'm trying to undermine public consciousness of legitimacy. Yeah. That's the point. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, a fairly easy way to do this then is to use the YouTube phenomenon, which a very, very large percentage of the videos that are high rank in YouTube are prank videos. Right. So in this particular thing, you basically have a perfect prank. I mean, this person goes in, they're, they're, they're showing the nice. video, you know. And so <coughs> when they freak out, they're like, oh my god, and they run out. 
you go, ha ha, prank two. And right. then you actually could actually, you know, and you you could portray it as a prank. And right. then after you've done the series of prank videos, great. where you've got um, a, an ad campaign, so to speak, that oh, come watch our pranks because they're cool. And yeah. then after afterwards, yeah, you have like another video that goes. Actually, you're going to have to get people yeah. to watch. It. So I liked it. I liked <laughs> the idea of setting it up as as a YouTube channel or as a reality TV show or as something that the culture is familiar with right. to sort of digest. But before all of that happens, I think it's important to have like real scientists on board that make sure that the data set is scientifically rigorous. So you have both, right? Because one is good at affecting the culture and one is good at being real value data. Right. Uh, yeah, another important thing about volunteers uh, society is that it's adaptive behavior. And uh, there's this one YouTube video I saw that was pretty interesting where uh, they had people in a room and they were they did a simple, you know, but simple math problem on, on the board, and uh, uh, and they had um, everyone except for the, for a, uh, a per one person who was the uh, the test subject uh, give the, ro the wrong, wrong answer. Wrong answer. Right, it's a conformity study. Mm -hmm. This was um, Brian suggested this that you could do iterations of the same experiment <laughs> with a group of people, so that you have a sort of group dynamic. If if you have either, um, oh, yeah. if you have either like a room of ten subjects and like is that group large enough for them to intervene, or if you had a group of ten subjects and nine of them were confederates of the experiment who just followed whatever the subject did, or or whatever, you get into sort of group psychology that way. Yeah, Morpheus. You can also rate the people; they can self-rate themselves. Are you a liberal? Are you Right. Let, let me talk about that for a second. So, so I would. The reason that's important is because part of what I want to do here is I want to identify traits of disobedient people, right? So, I like I would I would hypothesize that homeschool kids are more likely to intervene than public school kids, and if that was part of government school kids, yeah. Uh, if that was if that was part of the survey and you could discern that about your subjects, you'd be able to show a statistical difference. It might be liberals and conservatives, it might be it might be whatever, but if you know what those traits are, that becomes relevant data for activists mm -hmm. to know not only like who they're pursuing with the liberty message, but also um, like what kind of what kind of upbringing, what kind of society you have to build for this sort of thing to be to be sustainable without power structures. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not a professional ethicist, as we are not in case and way against authority. I have a question the whole concept of professional ethicists. I think anybody should be an ethicist. Yeah, uh, I, did I say professional I, ethicist? I'm no, just not. I have to be wise in order to have a degree. If my memory is taken, they all use this said, I have all have a problem okay. said otherwise. What, what I, I guess what I mean is. Um, that there are people whose reputation establishes them as ethicists. Uh, like, like I, I understand the non-aggression principle. I sort of think about ethics in my own daily life and my own daily actions. But, as everybody, but as everybody should. But for example, like Stefan Molyneux has this sort of reputation as an ethicist. He's made a career out of writing well, books on ethics, right? Oh, of course they do. Yeah. Um, but you want, you want input from uh, those kinds of people, and there aren't, there aren't, as far as I know, very many people that. Um, make a career out of the study of ethics, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, John? Uh, it might be cool to have in the corner near the door where the police brutality is apparently going on, like a piece of furniture that can be picked up for a club or something, to see if some people grab the club before the they go in to, oh, yeah. to level oh. the playing field with the cop. That might be like an extra bonus. Or even just a, <laughs> a, a stool, a fire extinguisher. Yeah, that person was intending on it. Oh, that's me. Spray working on two fire extinguishers. Yeah, I, I actually I like that a lot. Well, yeah, but either, it's an opportunity for the subject to retaliate, but there's nobody to phys there's physically nobody to retaliate against, so there's no right. so risk of injury. Yeah. Yeah. That also equalizes the the problem that. Um, there's sort of a lot of people are saying it's not a perfect test because they're not intervening against an equal, they're intervening against somebody who is armed. Well, you have it be both because you can see if there's a difference. What about right. just have, make it be a mall cop? Yeah. A mall, make it a mall yeah. cop? Yeah. That's actually, you know, people, people laugh about that, but there have been studies on, on people's reactions to specific uniforms, and they've shown that private security does get more compliance than street clothes. So, I mean, that is, it is sort of relevant. Um, could, yeah? So I don't know what the regulations would be. What would this experiment look like if we were to follow the normal regulations? What, where are we different? Um, 
I'm not sure. I think well, part of it is um, I don't think that you can deceive them anymore. So in the Milgram experiment, they were deceived as to the point of the experiment, right? There's so no they. Data about that. What's that? There's no data. You don't. Yeah, Brian, do you know, maybe know the answer to this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, the deception would be allowed by the EPA and the other regulating agencies, but with a, a large amount of red tape. Uh, you know, you can do that. It's very limited as to be very well justified. Um, so if, if you submit a study for approval that contains um, deception of any kind, then you're going to be held to a lot of scrutiny. Uh, Many, many safeguards to make sure that harm doesn't happen uh, and things like that. Is that uh, the truth is, the you know things like Stanford Prison Experiment, Milgram study, would not be approved again. And that's where you're getting what you're saying is these studies that are a little weaker because that's what can get approved. Right. So um, uh, it would be allowed in a form that isn't too difficult for the participants. Um, but you're sort of expressing that you want it to be difficult, um, and that's probably they probably wouldn't accept it. You know, it, this is something that they might do. Uh, they might get on board with it enough paperwork. I think without a lot of legitimacy yeah. to write it, submit it, when they don't uh, approve it, then do it as yeah. something yeah. Actually get it not yeah. approved yeah. before we start. In fact, it gives you a springboard for the ethical guidelines because we start with their objections and, and we answer each one of them and we can really do a variety of APA objections and the voluntary. That also, uh, that undermines the problem of that and he was saying that uh, anarchists lack legitimacy because if, if we if we can say that we attempted to go through conventional channels and were rejected, then then maybe that under 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 you go through the, the normal channels of kind of like an APA certified. Just have to find somebody to do it on site. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. It, it seems like the APA, with their revised ethical guidelines, are actually protecting authority. Yeah, I think so. Is there? Dissension within the APA about this authoritarianism? No, look, they have, they, have, they have good intentions of, of keeping people safe. I, I think what, what is going on here is is just that um, people people like Dobby are just saying, you know, maybe we don't need to be as controlled. And in the spirit of libertarianism, maybe the idea is that we don't need them to understand how to keep people safe. That we understand this might be a little stressful for people, but can we design it in a way that's safe, not going to lead to trauma? Uh, without needing to use, um, you know, their official approval, and that you know we we respect other human beings. We don't we don't need them to tell us how to respect other human beings. That's how I interpret everything you're saying. Um, and you know, uh, they their guidelines do protect people from bad studies. The question is maybe are they preventing studies that wouldn't really do much harm that would also have a lot of benefit? That's possible because they're they're fairly strict. You know, so uh, yeah, I think there is a, a libertarian issue with the initiation of fraud, um, you know, the study that involves deception. But um, it occurs to me that, that potentially something like this could be crowdfunded as part of a series of studies, uh, and um, participants perhaps could be uh, told that the series of studies, uh, you know, some of them may involve deception. Right. Or in ahead of time, like yeah, if, right. if you kind of sign up, specify at the very beginning, you're going to necessarily which particular studies or which particular type of deception, but just you know, as kind of a uh, that might be. To, I mean, to 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 come out the gate and say there's going to be a whole series of studies, this is much more of a financial investment, and so I feel like um, we would have to sort of like prove that we could do one before we could promise to do others, if that makes sense. Like, like Morgan Spurlock comes to mind. His first movie was uh, Super Size Me. It was this documentary about 30 days on, on eating McDonald's. And then he took the success of that documentary and he turned it into the series 30 Days, where every episode was 30 days doing something else, right? Um, but I'm willing to bet he pitched the documentary as one documentary at the beginning. Um, so, I mean, if, 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 if this succeeded and we had sort of a research company and we had sort of funding and we could, we could realistically say we were going to continue doing an ongoing series of, of experiments, then that sounds realistic. I think um, the point he's making, though, is that if you change the, the frog from being something that's traumatic, you know, like you have something that's not expected to be traumatic at all, no <laughs> danger, no nothing, and, and you give them a, a, an idea that, all right, well, potentially I'm going to experience something deceptive or, tra or traumatic, the fraud right. that it's actually only now, this one moment, may change things. So if you said to them, all right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to show you a trailer for, um, it's a sequel to The Passion of the Christ. 
Okay. okay. And so, you know, right. they're expecting you're going to see something. So are, really you, are, you, are you willing to see video of potentially it's brutal movie, behavior? It's a very, very watchable movie if you tell them that. And then the, yeah. the surprise, the fraud is very minimal in difference. Um, or if you say to them, all right, well, we're going to do a series of experiments, which may include lying to you, um, all those kind of things. And you, you explain all these different things, get their consent, and then you actually want to do one experiment. Sure. This one experiment. Essentially, I just want to conclude. If you guys want to grab one of these, these have my email address on the first and the last page. And uh, if, if you want to send me any of your concerns, any of your ideas, if you have names of people who you think would be good to collaborate, I'm open to all of these things. These, this idea is only two months old. So this is sort of the progress I've made in the last two months. And uh, right now, I'm sort of in a team building phase. So I'm, I'm looking for um, people to keep me honest, people to keep me scientifically rigorous and ethical, and especially people who can consult with me to make sure it's as good as possible. Um, but we're about out of time. So I want to thank you all for coming. And, uh, and have a good conference. Thanks. When it comes to investing in precious metals, you need a source you can trust who offers you choices and empowers you to maximize your wealth. That's where Roberts & Roberts Brokerage can help. Roberts & Roberts is a trusted name in precious metals. Since 1977, Roberts & Roberts has been providing you with the finest gold and silver bullion, coins, rounds, and bars at genuine and honest prices. They make it easy to invest in precious metals and work with you to suit your investment needs. In addition to offering gold and silver for sale for U.S. dollars, Roberts & Roberts Brokerage is now accepting Bitcoin in exchange for their quality precious metals products. To speak with a professional from Roberts & Roberts about investing in precious metals, call toll-free 800-874-9760. Write this number down, 800-874-9760. Visit Roberts & Roberts online at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. On behalf of Roberts & Roberts, here's hoping your day is as good as gold.